at the Xinhua University, the Prime Minister will be addressing a think tank, he'll be addressing students. Uh, and this is a crucial way that China also decides it, its policy uh, based on the future generation. What they, uh, what, why is the Xinhua University so important? No, I think the Xinhua University is important because it's the premier university. That's where it's like, uh, uh, you know, the Ecoles in Paris. You see, most of the civil servants, most of the decision makers, policy makers, you know, come out of Xinhua. And Fudan, one of the three or four universities in China that produce the elite in China. So that's why it's important. Your Excellency, Foreign Minister Wang, distinguished guests, faculties, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Today, we are honored to welcome Prime Minister Modi in Qinghua. First of all, on behalf of all of the faculties and the students, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Prime Minister Modi and all the members of uh, his delegation. Today we also have Foreign Minister Wang Yi and the students, teachers, and uh, guests from domestic and abroad. Welcome. China and India enjoy long history in friendship and history. Prime Minister Modi visited Xi'an. He studied Chinese culture, and he had talked with with, China, uh, with President Xi Jinping in recent years. Tsinghua University contributed a lot to promote the uh, cultural exchanges between China and India. In the year 2007, the Madam Chairman of the Congress Party, Sonia Gandhi, visited our school and delivered a speech. Our school signed academic cooperation agreements with Indian Institute of uh, Technology, Mumbai, and Delhi. In the campus of Tsinghua, we have uh, students and scholars from India. We welcome more and more brilliant young people and scholars to visit Tsinghua. I'm also looking forward to see more students and teachers from Tsinghua to visit India for study and exchange. Since the establishment of the Tsinghua University, we welcome the more and more leaders from different communities of the world with open mind and a global vision. Today we have uh, Prime Minister Modi join us and to give us a speech. Prime Minister was born in 1950 in the Gujarat state. He has, he has served as the Secretary General to the Janata Party and also the Secretary General to the whole country. Since the 2001, he has been the Chief Minister of the State of Gujarat for 13, 13 years. During the 16th election of the 2014, his party won the majority seats. He became the Prime Minister in May 2014. Since Prime Minister Modi took office, he spared a lot of effort to promote the econ economic uh, economic reform and the high speed growth of the India economy has attracted international attention. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to give my time and floor to Prime Minister Modi to give us a speech. Honorable Foreign Minister, Honorable President of the University, Wachan Han Kao Xing. I'm very happy. Nimanchuet, Joshua 
ભાઈબુ ખાઈ ખાઈમાં યુ આર અ વર્લ્ડ ક્લાસ ઇન્સ્ટિટ્યુશન યુ આર અ સિમ્બલ ઓફ સક્સેસ ઓફ ચાઇનાસ એજ્યુકેશન સેક્ટર યુ આર ધ ફાઉન્ડેશન ફોર ચાઇનાસ ઇકોનોમિક મેરેકલ યુ હેવ પ્રોડ્યુસ ગ્રેટ લીડર્સ ઇન્ક્લુડિંગ પ્રેસિડેન્ટ શી ઇટ ઇઝ નોટ સરપ્રાઇઝિંગ that china's economic growth and its new leadership in research science and technology have taken a place together i particularly like the old chinese saying if you think in terms of year plant a seed if in think in terms of 10 years plant a trees but if you in terms of 100 years then teach the people in india to the ancient saying is vaye krute vardhate eva nityam વિદ્યાધનમ સર્વધન પ્રધાનમ ધ વેલ્થ દેટ ઇન્ક્રીઝીઝ બાય ગિવિંગ દેટ વેલ્થ ઇઝ નોલેજ એન્ડ ઇઝ સુપ્રીમ ઓફ ઓલ પજેશન્સ ધીસ ઇઝ વન એક્ઝામ્પલ ઓફ અવર હાઉ અવર ટુ નેશન્સ are united in their timeless wisdom there is much more though that links our two ancient civilizations i began my journey in china in xian in doing so retrace the footsteps of the chinese monk hanstang he traveled to india from xian in the 7th century in search of knowledge and returned to xian as a friend and chronicler of india present his visit in india last september started from amdavad it is not far from vadnagar my birthplace but important because it hosted huen sang and many pilgrims from china the world's first large scale educational exchange program took place between india and china during the thang dynasty records talk of about 80 indian monks coming to china and nearly 150 chinese monks returning after their education in india and yes this was in the 10th and 11th century mumbai's rise as a port and a ship building center each because of cotton trade with china and those who love silk and textile know that India's famous Tanchoi sarees owe themselves to three brothers from my state of Gujarat who learned the art of weaving from Chinese masters in the 19th century and in an unquestionable evidence of our ancient trade silk in our classical Sanskrit language is called shina patta so the centuries old story of our relations of spiritualism learning art and trade it is a picture of respect for each other's civilization 
and of shared prosperity. It is reflected in the human values of Dr. Dwarkanath Kotnis, a doctor from India who treated soldiers in China during the Second World War. Today, after difficult and sometimes dark passages of history, India and China stand at a rare moment a vast multiple transition in the world. Perhaps the most significant change of this era is the re-emergence of China and India. The world's two most populous nations are undergoing economic and social transformation on a scale and at a speed that is unmatched in history. China's success over the past three decades has changed the character of the global economy. India is now the next frontier of the economic revolution. We have the demography for it. About 800 million people in India are below the age of 35 years. Their aspirations, energy, enterprise and skills will be the force for India's economic transformation. We know and we now have the political mandate and the will to make it happen. Over the past year, we have moved with a clear and coherent vision. And we have acted with speed, resolve, and boldness to implement it. We have taken sweeping steps to reform our policies and open up more to foreign direct investments. This includes new areas like insurance, construction, defense, and railways. We are eliminating unnecessary regulations and simplifying our procedures. We are using digital technology to eliminate multiple approvals and endless wait. We are building a tax regime that is predictable, stable and competitive and that will integrate the Indian market. We are scaling up investment in next generation infrastructure, roads, ports, railways, airport, telecom, digital network and clean energy. Our resources are being allocated with speed and transparency and we will make sure that land acquisition does not become a barrier to growth or a burden on farmers. We are creating the global skill pool to establish a modern economy with a world-class manufacturing sector. We are reviving our agricultural sector to restore the fortunes of our farmers and boost our growth. Like China, urban renewal is both a necessity and a means to add energy to our economy. We are combining traditional strategies with modern economic instruments to eliminate poverty and create security for the poor. We have launched a major schemes on financial inclusion of all providing funds to the Sun Bank, to the Unbank, and ensuring efficient and direct transfer of benefit to the poor. And we are ensuring that insurance and pension schemes reach the poorest. We have set time-bound goals for providing access to housing, water, and sanitation to all. This would not 
just transform lives but also generate a new source of economic momentum. Above all, we are changing the way we govern ourselves, not just in the way we work in New Delhi, but also in the way we work together with state governments, districts and cities. Because we know, as you do, that our vision may be formed in Delhi, but our success will be determined by state capitals. That is why I am here today with two chief ministers, which is a new aspect of our foreign policy. And for the first time for India, Premier Lee and I had met with provincial leaders and chief minister to discuss our partnership. I know that rewriting policies can be easier than changing mindsets and work culture. But we are on the right path. You will feel the change in India and you can see it in our growth rate. It has now increased to 7.5% and we are encouraged by international experts speak in one voice of higher growth rates. In many ways, our two countries reflect the same aspirations, similar challenges, and the same opportunities. We can be inspired by each other's successes. And in the global uncertainties of our times, we can reinforce each other's progress. Perhaps no other economy in the world offer such opportunities for the future as India's. And few partnerships are as filled with promise and ours. During President Xi's visit last September, we set for ourselves a new level of ambition for our cooperation. Partnership in modernizing Indian railways two Chinese industrial parks in India, commitments of $20 billion in investments into India, our the next five years partnership in our Make in India mission, that is the shape of our future. Tomorrow in Shanghai, we will see the agreements on first of those partnership between our industries. But to maintain this partnership over the long run, we must also improve the exchange of Indian industry to the Chinese market. I am encouraged by President Xi's and Premier Li's commitment to resolve this problem. As much as our bilateral cooperation, our international partnership will be important for each other's success. Our changing world has created new opportunities and challenges. We both face instability in our shared neighborhood that can threaten our security and slow down our economies. The spreading tide of extremism and terrorism is a threat we both face for both its source is in the same region. We must also deal with the changing character of terrorism that has made it less predictable and more diffuse. We source a large part of our energy from the same region that faces instability and uncertainty future. India and China conduct their international commerce on the same sea lanes. The security of Sea lanes is vital for our two economies and our cooperation is essential to achieve it. Equally, we both seek to connect a fragmented Asia. There are projects we will pursue individually. There are few such as the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar, 
corridor that we are doing jointly. But geography and history tell us that the dream of an interconnected Asia will be successful when India and China work together. We are two countries that have gained a lot from an open, rule-based, global trading system. Equally, we have most to lose if it breaks down. We both have enormous stakes in the international negotiations on climate change. Our cooperation in these reforms will be crucial to shape their outcomes. Today, we speak of Asia's resurgence. It is the result of the rise of many powers in the region at the same time. It is an Asia of great promise, but also many uncertainties. Asia's reemergence is leading to a multipolar world that we both welcome. But it is also an unpredictable and complex environment of shifting equations. We can be more certain of a peaceful and stable future for Asia if India and China cooperate closely. A resurgent Asia is seeking a bigger voice in global affairs. India and China seek a greater role in the world. It may be reforms in the United Nations Security Council or the new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. But Asia's voice will be stronger and our nation's role more influential if India and China speak in one voice for all of us and for each other. Simply put the prospects of the 21st century becoming the Asian century will depend in large measures of what India and China achieve individually and what we do together. <laughs> the rising fortunes of 2.5 billion pairs of joint hands will be of the greatest consequences of our region and the humanity. This is the vision that I share with President Xi and Premier Li. This is the impulse that is driving our relationship. In recent years, we have depended our political engagement. We have kept our borders peaceful. We have managed our differences and not allowed them to impact closer cooperation. We have enhanced our cooperation across the full spectrum of our relationship. Yet, if we have to realize the extraordinary potential of our partnership, we must also address the issues that lead to hesitation and doubts, even distrust in our relationship. First, we must try to settle the boundary question quickly. We both recognize that this is history legacy. Resolving it is our shared responsibility to the future. We must move ahead with new purpose and determination. The solution we choose should do more than settle the boundary question. It should do so in a manner that transforms our relationship and not cause new disruptions. We have been remark remarkably successful in maintaining peace and tranquility along the border. We must continue to do that on the principle of mutual and equal security. Our agreements, protocols and border mechanisms have been helpful. But a shadow of uncertainty always hangs over the sensitive areas of border region. It is because neither side knows where the line of actual control is in this area. That is why 
I have proposed resume the process of clarifying it. We can do this without prejudice to our position on the boundary question. We should think of creative solution to issues that have become irritants from visa policies to trans-border rivers. Sometimes small steps can have a deep impact on how our people see each other. We are both increasing our engagement in our shared neighborhood. This calls for deeper strategic communication to build mutual trust and confidence. We must ensure that our relationship with other countries do not become a source of concern for each other. And wherever possible and feasible, we should work together as we did in responding to the earthquake in Nepal. If the last century was the age of alliance, this is an era of interdependence. So, talks of alliances against one another have no foundation. In any case, we are both ancient civilizations, large and independent nations. Neither of us can be contained or become part of anyone's plans. So, our partnership in international forum should not be determined by the concerns of others, but the interests of our two countries. China's support for India's permanent membership of a reform UN Security Council and for India's membership of export control regime like nuclear supplies group will do more than just strengthen our international cooperation. It will take our relationship to a new level. It will give Asia a stronger voice in the world. If we are able to deepen mutual trust and confidence, we will also be able to reinforce each other's efforts of connecting Asia with itself and the rest of the world. Our soldiers face each other on the border, but we should also deepen our defense and security cooperation to address our many common challenges. Above all, as we look ahead, we must build more bridges of familiarity and comfort between our people. About 33% of the world's population is either Indian or Chinese. Yet, our people know very little of each other. We must seek inspiration from the pilgrims of the ancient times who braved the unknown in search of knowledge and enrich us both. So we have decided to extend electronic tourist visa to Chinese nationals. We are also we are celebrating the year of India in China in 2015. We are launching the provincial and state leaders forum today. Later today, we will have the Tai Chi and yoga event. It will represent the coming together of our two civilizations. <laughs> we are starting the Gandhi and India Study Center in Furan University and a College of Yoga in Kunming. The second route to Kailash Mansarovar for Indian pilgrims will start in June, for which I want to thank President Xi. These are just some of the many steps India and China are taking to bring the world's two largest populations in closer contact. For this reason, I choose to speak today at a university because it is the youth that will inherit the future of our countries and the responsibility of our relationship. President Xi has spoken eloquently 
about the interconnected dreams of China and India and the new type of relationship between major countries. Not only are our dreams interconnected, our future is also deeply interconnected. We are at a moment when we have the opportunity to make our choices. India and China are two proud civilizations and two great nations that will fulfill their destinies. We each have the strength and the will to choose our own paths to success. But we have the ancient wisdom to know that our journey will be smoother and our future brighter when we will, we will walk together confident of one another and in step with each other. Thank you very much and thanks for your invitation. Thanks a lot.